Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Digital Banking Symposium 2020, organized by the Singapore Fintech Association and the Banking and Financial Services Union. This session on insight sharing and case studies on digital banking is presented by the grand sponsor of this symposium, Huawei Cloud. Now, as banks execute cloud transformative strategies for the reasons of business agility and innovation, they continue to face challenges from the perspectives of infrastructure, application, and data. Banks may take different approaches to tackle each challenge, while the cloud and ecosystem play a crucial role to accelerate this process. We're going to be looking at some of these cases during this presentation. I am privileged that we have with us a group of esteemed speakers. Mr. Wu Shi Wei, the Chief Technology Officer of Huawei Cloud APAC. Mr. Matthew Chen, Group CEO, Sunline Overseas Business Group. Mr. Edward He Zhao Kai, Senior Business Development Manager, Wallet. Mr. Jay Li, Account Director, Cloudwise. I will now hand my time over to the speakers for this presentation. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Digital Banking Symposium 2020, organized by the Singapore Fintech Association and the Banking and Financial Services Union. This session on insight sharing and case studies on digital banking is presented by the grand sponsor of this symposium, Huawei Cloud. Now, as banks execute cloud transformative strategies for the reasons of business agility and innovation, they continue to face challenges from the perspectives of infrastructure, application, and data. Banks may take different approaches to tackle each challenge, while the cloud and ecosystem play a crucial role to accelerate this process. We are going to be looking at some of these cases during this presentation. I am privileged that we have with us a group of esteemed speakers. Mr. Wu Shi Wei, the Chief Technology Officer of Huawei Cloud APAC. Mr. Matthew Chen, Group CEO, Sunline Overseas Business Group. Mr. Edward He Zhao Kai, Senior Business Development Manager, Wallet. Mr. Jay Li, Account Director, Cloudwise. I will now hand my time over to the speakers for this presentation. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to the event today. My name is Wu Shiwei, CTO of Huawei Cloud APAC region. My sharing topic today is cloud adoption in banking industry where I will be first talking about the key drive forces for banks to go cloud, followed by how cloud technology and solutions address the current challenges. And at last, I would like to invite three leading industry solution partners to talk about how their solutions add value to FSI industry. First of all, what are the key motivations for banks to go cloud? I've been told many reasons, such as scalability, one of the most frequently mentioned words, and also DevOps, cost optimization, etc., etc. However, after deep discussion with many of my clients, I found two key motivations that are behind all other reasons and driving cloud adoption. They are number one, business agility. Number two, innovation. Just to give you some examples of business agility and innovation requirements, a bank may want to launch a Happy Friday promotion to encourage their e-wallet users to shopping with QR payment. They will work with merchants to give huge discount every Friday, which potentially increase the transaction volume to X million per minute. Now, what is the first question you will ask in order to prepare such an event. Scalability, right? Yes. Think about what we need to address scalability without cloud. 
we will need to estimate the transaction volume. We need to estimate the extra service you need to prepare. If there is not enough service, you need to raise a procurement request. This whole process could take months, which basically making your go to market quickly impossible. So the real problem here is not about money or ROI, at least not the entire problem. The real problem here is your go to market speed and the try and error capability. You want to quickly test the market. If it fails, it should fail safe, which translates to business agility. Other examples, like implement a new feature to interface with core banking system. Again, takes months to plan in old days. Support an urgent request from government, such as cash aid during COVID-19. Again, you cannot wait for two months to implement such a feature. It is all about how quickly you can address the market needs. Now, regarding to innovation, a typical scenario, for example, is implement a digital onboarding process to support those people who have limited access to banking services. They may live in a remote area or they have difficulties to visit bank branches. Such system requires integration with a number of AI technologies, such as facial recognition, OCR, live body check, digital signature, etc. If you do not have cloud, you will have to buy each technology from the market or train your own AI models, which basically makes your innovation trial very expensive. Cloud provides a very efficient platform to try out new technologies and build proof of concept products. I just explained business agility and innovation are the key requirements. Now, let's take a look at the challenges to address business agility and innovation. I have already mentioned some challenges as example in last slide. Now, I would like to summarize three types of challenges in overall. The first challenge is the infrastructure. I briefly mentioned in last slide, you have to consider ROI, the time needed for procurement, and even you have gone through the first two, you will need to consider your data center capacity when adding new clusters. The second challenge comes from application level, the complexity of interfacing with legacy systems, the difficulty in terms of monitoring and troubleshooting a complex application system, especially in a microservice design system where thousands of services form a complex service mesh. These two basically requires us to do extensive testing before we can release a new feature hence causing long release cycles. The third challenge comes from data level. Even you have addressed the infrastructure challenge, the application challenge, you need to consider data, especially when you are doing innovation type of development. You may lack of training data. You may lack of skilled development resources. You would want to have some off the shelf APIs to get started quickly. Now, is cloud technology able to address all the challenges mentioned above? Well, some are yes, such as IT capacity, scalability, OPEX versus CAPEX, even AI big data platform. But the rest are not. You cannot solve legacy system integration with cloud technology alone. You cannot implement open banking API with just cloud technology. You will have to do a lot of in-house development to integrate cloud technologies together with your data, your business process to form a complete solution. Or you may consider leveraging cloud ecosystem to accelerate your development. In the next few slides, I would give you some showcases how you may adopt cloud technology and ecosystem solutions to quickly go to market. First of all, I divided the bank IT portfolio into three sections, roughly. The first section is backend, including core banking system and data platform. The second is the front end, which mainly are the omnichannel applications, such as mobile banking, 
e-wallet, call center, etc. And the last section is IT operation and support. Now, let's look at each section one by one. For core banking system, this is usually the most difficult part to deal with. If you want to move any serious business applications to cloud and really enjoy the benefits brought by cloud, core banking is always a bottleneck you want to address. I have basically seen two types of approaches to tackle this issue. The first approach is to avoid it. Excuse me for lack of better terms to describe this approach. Basically, what some banks are doing is to provide a cloud-native middle layer above the core banking system to encapsulate the scalability, caching, DevOps features into this middle layer. Then you can deploy your front-end applications based on this middle layer without worrying the impact to your core banking system. There are third-party core banking middle layer solutions available in this market. Or you can also develop it yourself. Either way, this middle layer can be hosted on cloud and have direct connect with core banking system. Then you have the flexibility to develop cloud-native front-end applications. And furthermore, you can even leverage Kubernetes Federation technology to achieve seamless multi-cloud deployment, which I have seen some of my clients doing uh, with Huawei Cloud's multi-cloud container platform service. The second approach is to replace it. Basically, you are building your business applications directly on top of a cloud-native core banking system. This approach usually happens in a bank who has non or small legacy asset, such as virtual banks in recent years. This may also happen in a bank who is practicing so-called double core strategy, where you will have the legacy core banking system running aside with the cloud native core banking system. You migrate to cloud native core banking system module by module, feature by feature. And it may take a long time until you can safely decommission the legacy core banking system. Either way, cloud native core banking system need an environment to host, and the best option would be cloud, regardless it is public cloud or dedicated cloud. For example, Huawei Cloud work with our partners, like Sunline, to provide a total solution, including both cloud environment and the core banking system to speed up the deployment process. In a virtual bank case, we managed to help a virtual bank open for business from scratch within nine months after they get their virtual banking license. Now, regarding to the other important system in backend, which is the data platform, roughly there has been three evolution phases. The first phase is basically using MPP, like Oracle, Greenplum, and Teradata. Then Hadoop-based system become popular from the last few years, where you will combine both structured and unstructured data and process the data with distributed computing power. The most recent big data platform is a universal data lake practice with separation of compute and storage design. Take Huawei Cloud as an example. Use object storage service, OBS, as a data lake storage. OBS supports multiple big data protocols, such as HDFS, POS6, or S3 compatible protocols. Then you can leverage all kinds of processing technologies without any data duplication or movement, including Huawei Cloud's in-house development platform such as Model Arts, open source technologies such as Hadoop, or third-party commercial technologies such as Cloudera. This brings benefits in both storage cost saving and data management flexibility. After introducing the current trend in core banking systems, now, I would like to talk about channel application systems, which is the front-end applications. I found in this particular field, the development trend is pretty much the same for all banks. To fully adopt containerization and uh, microservice design, so to achieve agile development and uh, easy migration to cloud, instead of just lift and shift. There are basically two considerations in this process. 
first one is performance and scalability. Performance in order to achieve better cost effectiveness and scalability to handle ad hoc traffic peak and a better user experience. The second one is multi-cloud practice, as most banks do not want to have vendor locking. Apparently, cloud technology has developed new solutions to address both the requirements. Take Huawei Cloud as an example again. Huawei Cloud has released container service on bare metal server solution to save virtualization cost. Some additional features we provided is one, we put a special device into the bare metal server called SDI card. And we offload the container management workload to this SDI card. So the CPU power of this bare metal server can be fully utilized for client computing workload. The other feature is we use Ola OS for bare metal server. This OS is a much lightweighted operating system developed by Huawei to further reduce performance cost on operating system. In terms of multi-cloud, some Kubernetes Federation-based services have been released by GCP or Huawei Cloud. Because obviously, multi-cloud adoption is more in favor by new market commerce. But I believe all cloud vendors will have to provide multi-cloud solution one way or another to address the client needs. So far, Kubernetes Federation is most practical and well adopted. As I mentioned previously, it is common practice for banks to enhance in-house development, while also working with industry partners to accelerate go-to-market. As a result, cloud vendors must provide ecosystem support to assist the banks in this field. Hence, I've shown an overall picture of Huawei Cloud's collaboration model with our technology partners. Huawei Cloud will focus on fundamental cloud architecture which we call Qingtian architecture, and the cloud deployment services hosted upon, regardless public, hybrid, or edge cloud. Qingtian architecture has two main focuses. The first focus is hardware-software synergy. As you may know, Huawei Cloud is probably the only cloud vendor who produces both hardware and software to implement our cloud. Thus, hardware-software synergy is driving the continuous enhancement of cloud performance. To give you an example, the SDI card on bare metal server, as I mentioned in last slide, is one of the features offered by hardware software synergy. The other focus is the Alcade cloud brain, which mainly handles task scheduling across different platforms, including cloud, edge, and devices. It is mainly driving the enhancement of cloud management efficiency. The technology partner will build their solutions leveraging the features provided by Qingtian architecture. This diagram is basically another angle of our partner ecosystem view, which shows the industry vertical solutions and the cross-industry horizontal solutions built on top of Qingtian architecture. In FSI industry specifically, Many partners are from China who developed very innovative solutions, well-tested and proven in Chinese market, and now landing in this region together with Huawei Cloud, such as eWallet, Microloan, Wealth Management, etc. Today, I actually have invited three partners to give their view of the industry development from core banking, channel application, and IT management perspectives accordingly. Now, just to finish up and discuss the last important part of banking IT portfolio, which is IT operation and management. I can see there are roughly five stages that banks are going through. Some may have uh, adopted all the five stages. Some may have adopted a few. The first stage from bottom to top is system health monitoring. What we want to achieve here is to monitor the system health 24 by 7 from monitoring nodes deployed globally, and alert the operation team if a failure has been detected. The goal is to identify a failure before the real user reports it, so the banks can jump ahead to fix it. Though it sounds a very basic feature, actually some banks still have not implemented such measure and can only respond to a failure after many users report it. 
The second stage is Application Performance Management, APM. The key difference to the first stage is you are now looking into the internal application and services, monitoring the service interaction internally rather than the external user interaction. This is particularly important when banks going through microservice design. Microservice design-based systems tend to have better reusability and scalability. However, it is also introduce complexity in terms of uh, troubleshooting and management. APM system will give detailed insights about each application and each service and their upper and downstream interactions, thus assist the operation team to identify root cause of any threats quickly. The third stage is AI ops. Many bank systems are time critical. Thus, you want to eliminate a potential threat before it becomes a failure. And you cannot rely on humans to perform such tasks for efficiency and cost reasons. With AI ops, you can create baseline operation status of each application automatically. In case of an abnormal situation detected, AI engine will respond automatically to handle this situation. Common methods including auto-scaling, pause non-critical workloads, switch to DR system, etc. The three stages mentioned now are mainly addressing the IT system itself. The next two stages are focusing towards business in IT perspective. In the fourth stage, you may not only consider a failure as an IT system crash, but a bad user experience is also considered as a failure. A simple example is um, internet banking registration. If a large number of users give up in the middle during the process, there must be something wrong in terms of the design of this workflow or a faulty system somewhere. So some banks now also implemented SDKs to collect user behavior data to provide insight about customer churn, UI design, workflow efficiency, etc. The goal is to provide data support for continuous user experience improvement. Now the last stage, I call it integrated operating model between business and IT. Basically, business operating indicators should be traced and reflect IT operating status. Take a simple example. A bank is monitoring daily transactions from business perspective. If transaction level drops significantly compared to normal time, the IT team should also spot this change in IT operation and quickly respond whether this change is caused by IT system failure. If IT operation spotted a system workload increase, business side should also see corresponding business indicators change to determine whether this is normal behavior or as a result of malicious attack. In this stage, banks become more aware of how their IT systems is performing regarding to business and hence able to make better decisions on IT investment. Here is the closure of my today's sharing. As I mentioned, I also invited three partners to give you some insight about their perspectives and real cases. I hope you enjoy the rest of sharing and thank you everyone. Hi everyone, my name is Matthew Chen. Today, I'd like to share with you how we can help banks to strive through collaborative banking. So these days, everyone's talking about banking 4.0. So what is banking 4.0? You know, a lot of people actually mistakenly thinking that, you know, banking 4.0 is just a um, mobile banking app, right? Um, you, you know, a very interesting test uh, to do is, you know, nowadays everyone has um, smartphones, right? So you can actually rank you know, all the applications, all the apps that you use on your smartphones, you can react them by screen time, right? You can see how, how actively that you are using your own mobile banking app. You know, usually, you know, without, without a doubt, usually your own mobile banking app is um, by far the last little dot in the end, right? So, so you know, it, you, everyone knows there's a super app in um, China, it's called WeChat, right? Commands one, you know, more than 1 billion users, right? Social, um, platform, the biggest social platform in China. Um, so a lot of people, a lot of banks actually think they can build um, a super app, 
but actually it proven is very difficult because all of the peoples that in the ecosystem, as you can look at, right, the, the outer layer is all your part of the ecosystem. So it doesn't matter travel, accommodation, shopping, shopping, education, you know, social entertainment, uh, medical tra transportation, lifestyle, so on and so forth. It's just that this part of the ecosystem, these people are not in your banking ecosystem. So it's very difficult to drag them into onto your mobile banking app, but rather the bank need to weave your product and services into your partner's ecosystem. So bank, banking 4.0 is all about working with and through your partner's ecosystem and to onboard customers, not only through your own channels, but through your partner's channel, right? So this is um, the first layer, the outer layer, the fundamental layer of uh, banking 4.0. But in order for that to happen, uh, it actually demands a very flexible core. You know, that's why we're talking about open banking, you know, open APIs. And then we're also talking about, you know, cloud native microservices orient oriented architecture, right? So because in order to weave your product and services into your partner's ecosystem, your core, you know, need to be very open and very flexible, right? This is why a lot of traditional core banking system probably is a bit obsolete because it's too monolithic, right? But a lot of people actually overlook the middle layer. So what is the middle layer? The middle layer is actually the analytical layer. So we like to call it the brains of a bank, decision-making. Uh, it's all about using big data and AI to do you know, risk management and position marketing. Right? Because unlike the old days, you know, the risk management, you can wait until the end of the day for the batch to run to give you the exposure and position to do risk management the next day. So T plus one no longer is enough, right? Everything has to happen now and here. So it's all about real time and T plus zero, right? So these three layers together, it will give you a full stack of banking 4.0. Now let's look at how banking 4.0 in action, right? So what you're looking at is actually one of the first digital bank in China. You probably guess, right? It is WeBank. Um, they got their banking license towards the end of 2014, and then we helped them to launch the, the digital platform in 2015. And then one of the first product they designed is actually to help university graduates to, to get a loan, to micro loan, to pay for their rental, right? As, as you know that Shenzhen these days is Silicon Valley, so the property price is really shooting through the roof. So they cannot afford to buy, they can only rent, but they don't have enough saving to even get that first down payment. Uh, so very small ticket item for a very small duration, but even that they cannot get a, a loan from a traditional bank. So that, that's why this micro um, loan product is really targeted at this very specific underserved market by using you know, big data and AI. And then look at them, right? So five years down the track, um, you know, the clock 100 million customers already. And look at NPL ratio, it's only 0 0.51. So very, very impressive stats here. You know, you might wonder, you know, it's very good about China, right? Because China is 1.4 billion, you know, a large population homogeneous countries with a super app such as WeChat, they can tap into, but what about outside of China, right? We have, you know, so, so many silos and not large enough population, right? So the example you're looking at, is actually one of the first digital bank in Philippines, right? So they have uh, no branches, one, just one HQ uh, with two ATM machines downstairs, right? So unlike China, you know, outside of China, there's still a, a large component of cash economy. So first question we need to resolve is how we handle the cash handling, right? So you can see that by helping, to, helping them to connect with more than 20,000 ATM machines, so other banks infra, right? So as long as they have a, you know, Visa Plus logo or you know, Paynet logo, uh, and you have a debit card from this bank, you can withdraw cash from any of these 20,000 ATM machines nationwide for free, right? Why for free? Because all the, inf the savings we help them to save on infra, they'll be able to pass on to the customers, right? And then cash in, right? So 8,000 7-Elevens. So using the concept of aging banking, we help them to connect with more than 8,000 7-Elevens to handle the cash ins. And then all the you know, utility bill payments, mobile top up, we help them connect with all the you know, payment entities. So all the payments can be made very conveniently at, at, the, at the fingertips. And then one of the important customer acquisition, actually they're working very closely with one of the largest e-wallet in Philippines, right? So by you know, weave that smart saving product into this e-wallet, because e-wallet obviously is not a bank, they cannot pay interest. Uh, a few clicks in the e-wallet, these customers of e-wallet can become these bank's customers just within a few clicks, right? So onboarding through the partner's app, right? That's what I talked about before. And then, um, you know, during the pandemic situation, even we helped them to launch a smart 
you know, smart loan product to help, especially with SMEs that has, you know, hardships, you know, going through some working capital issues to help them to, um, you know, get a loan 12 months, interest-free loans, you know, a fixed term loan for 12 months, right? So we can push out that kind of loan in a matter of days, right? So it's a very, very fast time to market. You know, you might wonder, right, you know, this is very good for a brand new digital bank, um, but what about, you know, you, if you are existing bank with, uh, you know, existing systems, so what do you do, right? Um, so some banks actually went on the path of um, just doing the outer layer, just mobile layer, right? So they, they created a digital skin and wrapped the digital skin around the existing core, but often they find that the existing core is too, too much a dinosaur to, you know, push product into the market. But then again, they don't want to go to a big bank because that's too risky. So we actually coined a solution, we call it a parallel solution. So it's actually a graduate replacement methodology. So what do I mean by that? We actually help them to launch a brand new digital bank. So almost like a building a wee bank, or, you know, or that Philippine bank, a brand new digital bank, a digital challenge bank within the bank, sitting side by side with your existing core without you know, disturbing the business as usual. You know, of course, we talk to the existing core in terms of customer information, in terms of regulatory reporting, as well as the data and general ledger. But the first phase, it, first phase is all about attracting NTB, new to bank customers, without touching the ETB, existing to bank customers, right? And the second phase, you know, once, you know, the, let's say your existing customers, you know, nothing stopping them from opening a digital account in the digital core, if they like the experience, experience in the digital core, nothing stopping them from close the bank account in the old core, transfer the fund and move to the new core. So they can migrate by themselves, which really, you know, really minimize the, the migration costs, right? There's only the last phase, you know, we left with a very handful of corporate banking customers because all the retail and, and SME customers, they'll be able to migrate themselves. So we only need to do the migration in, in the last phase for the corporate banking customers. And also by then, your, your banking users already get familiarized themselves with the digital core. So also minimize the so-called project risk, right? And um, you know, this example that you're looking at, you know, one of the first, our first customers in Thailand, you know, if you look at the, you know, the bottom right-hand corner, they are using a mainframe core banking system, a legacy system. So we help them to launch a digital core side by side. Now we're in the face of moving and ho hopefully converging the two core into one, right? And of course, these days, you know, you know, can't you can't do it with talking about cloud, right? So a lot of people are talking about cloud. So everything I talk about so far um, in this session can be, you know, can be made available on a cloud. Depending on the regulation of the country, it doesn't matter private cloud, you know, hybrid or public cloud, we can do that from technology point of view, right? So obviously we work very closely with Huawei. We can make our that digital platform really available, like almost like a turnkey, you know out box solutions through Huawei's cloud, right? So I'm conscious of time. So um, um, this, that will be the end of my presentation and I welcome any questions you might have. Thank you. Hi everyone, this is Edward from Wallet, a payment ecosystem solution provider. Wallet has been serving over 200 banks and with a total exceeding 35 million merchants worldwide. Walla is also a trusted partner for offering digital payment solutions to the banking industry. I want to cover the topics of digital banking and its customer journey and at the end, Walla services and a case study. I want to present a quick overview of the growth of global mobile payments. First of all, Despite many countries and the regions rapidly developing their digital payment solutions, cash remains the major tool of payments. From the chart, non-cash transactions are getting more popular worldwide, and the most significant change was happening in China, which now becomes almost a cashless country. Western countries Middle East regions and African countries are catching up with more digital payments, including credit cards, e-wallets, and QR codes, and contactless payments. Mobile phones, especially smartphones, are the leading hardwares needed for carry on digital payments. With stable internet access, almost all individuals in a country could access payments for online and offline 
face-to-face -face scenarios. Even for weak infrastructure, mobile phones are crucial tools for payments in the financial institutions to deliver their customers' financial services, including unbanked popul populations and underserved groups. There are four main archetypes for e-wallets. The key concept for e-wallets is to engage customers. Given their background, payment behaviors, and also financial situations. In that sense, e-wallets are taken to provide the necessary payment services, such as bill payments, money transfer, top-ups, and a gateway for multiple scenarios related to personal lifestyle, entertainment, and transportation. So here, here are four archetypes of e-wallets. Some of them are target the unbanked groups, and the other two times are mostly for the lifestyle-related scenarios, including most of the different major e-wallets in the region of Asia Pacific and worldwide. For the customer journey of digital banking, we can clearly see that digital banks are launching all the services now online combining bank services and payment services through their digital banking app. The digital bank's core values are very attractive to customers, including an ever easier banking account registration process, lower cost of transferring funds, and customized loyalty and rewarding systems. Digital banks are reshaping the banking industry and they are flexible to create innovative services based on the needs of customers constantly. So here digital banks are focusing on sectors including providing higher add value added services and a much more significant cost advantages and also step change and agility including system upgrading and maintenance. And most of all, that they are providing all digital services to their end customers. Digital banks release the open APIs for different services providers and build an ecosystem for customer journeys. Beyond the banking services, digital banks could integrate various vertical industry players to fulfill customers' requirements for a simple and a convenient lifestyle. So here, a regular customer, they could explore a easier registration process to apply for different financial services through digital banking app. And then they could also have access to different other service providers, including lifestyle scenarios, and their personal financial needs, investment requirements, and also personal value added services, all provided through the digital banking app. So here, Wallet is helping and empowers the digital banks for their services. Wallet provides the technical solutions for digital banks to set the roadmap for building the payment ecosystem. On the issuing side, Wallet empowers digital banks for virtual card issuing, customized loyalty programs, tax refunds, global remittance, and integration with different services providers. On the acquiring side, Wallet enables digital banks for merchant acquiring, online payment processing, unified QR code solutions for transactions, and also value added services to allow banks to collect data to pr provide personal loans, customized loans to their merchants. And then Wallet will also help banks to have standard, standardized open APIs to be integrated with different industry players. For example, catering industry, traveling, 
ticketing, delivery, loyalty, and e-commerces. All these value added services could be available on the digital banking app platform for their end customers. A case study from Wallet is that uh, for banks in Philippines, traditionally banks only provide very limited services to their customers. About 70% of the population in Philippines are unbanked. And customers are looking for a third party platform for personal financial services. The process is associated with higher risk, higher service fees, and also low stability. Because the services provided from the third party platform is not stable, customers are always underserved. So the goal of the banks in Philippines actually want actually to have new customer accounts and more deposits and lower down the services fees for the customers. And for the system wise, banks lack, lack of uh, agile system, adapting to higher frequency of transactions and intensive account activities, which then Wally will in the position to bring values to the bank to solve these pain points. So in this case, Wally provides the systems to the banks interacting with their core banking systems and manage the updates and upgrading of services to the customers. Wally also minimize banks technical development and then offer all inclusive digital payment solutions to enable banks for digital banking services. So Wally will grow its business and provide continuous operations with the bank together to serve the merchants and any customers to enable more digital services scenarios on the digital banking platform. And then Wally will also have the very enriched marketing experience to let the banks to have a clear trace of their digital ecosystem building process. That's pretty much the sharing for me today, and thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Jay Lee. I'm the Territory Sales Manager of Cloudwise. It's a great pleasure and honor to join this event with Huawei, and I'm presenting one of the practice in terms of intelligent operation for digital banking and financial services. Today, we see banking in a totally different way comparing with what we've been seeing in 10 years ago. It was all about physical presence like ATM and branches, but now it is all about mobile devices and an enhanced and even more closer relationship with end users. Just like a lot of traditional business, Banking and financial services has been changed dramatically by internet, digital, and intelligent economy. We are facing a lot of opportunities from internetized business model and digital technology. Meanwhile, we are also seeing a lot of challenges in the journey of digital transformation. The continuous, and the continuous development and application of new technologies like cloud computing, Docker technology, and X has pushed Business, the business system architecture becoming more and more complex, which is also making the traditional operation and maintenance work much more challenging. And the traditional way of solution like adding more people into the operation team or even putting more skilled or experienced ones is becoming less effective as it was before. This is where we come to AI Ops. To CloudWise, AI Ops is a platform that integrates all captured and filtered data by all sorts of monitoring tools in the IT environment to provide a complete business analysis to, for conducting multiple IT services. What's even more important, the data science and cross-surface analysis has enabled AI Ops platform to provide a unified monitoring and digital analysis on user experience and all the matrix related. In a simple word, the only and ultimate focus of AI Ops is all about business outcomes and customer experience. 
This is the latest definition of AI ops by Gartner. We found clockwise direction is quite aligned. In this definition, to go around the circle, AI ops is composed by three parts. The observed with op monitoring tool, the engage with IT service management, and act with automation. And here's the solution set of CloudWise AI Ops platform. From the bottom to top, we have a full suite of monitoring tools as the foundation, such as the infrastructure and network monitoring, application monitoring, and not analysis. And in the upper panel, we have digital operation data platform to collect all the data from by the monitoring tools bureau. With the data platform, the captured and filtered data will be sorted and categorized as a database. Combined with configuration management database, this crossover is enabling the data platform with intelligent and analytic and metrics management in terms of digital operation. And finally, to the top panel, we have the products that fits into a broad set, a broader set of scenarios like management console, event management, service management, and apps. What's most importantly, the whole set of solutions is not a closed or isolated system. Actually, it's an open technology that every single running rectangle is modularized. They can be replaced by the current tools or solutions you've been using or be integrated to the platform you're currently implementing. So let's look into the case and see what we are really doing. The customer in the case is known as CUP or UPI, as a Chinese financial services corporation headquartered in Shanghai. It provides bank card services and a major card scheme in mainland China. It is the only interbank network in China that links all the ATM of all banks as well as post networks throughout the country. As you can imagine, every day it generates huge amounts of log data, which is more than 20 terabytes. One of the business units of customers is called Yun San Fu. It's one of the biggest online payment methods in China, just like Alipay or WeChat Pay. And one of the typical use scenario of consumer in China is to get on the bus and scan the QR code with Yun San Fu app and pay the bus bill. To customer side, there's a lot of behavior data and transactions between the bank, the bus company, and Yun San Fu itself. All of the data is generated just by a single end user and by every scan and pay on the bus, just in one to two seconds. However, when things happen and something back and something something in the back end process goes wrong, end user cannot get on the bus, or it has to be double charged. The complaints is inevitable and the user experience must be low. Meanwhile, customers find it really hard and costly to monitor and trace back the transaction. And hard, it, and hard to identify and locate the issue too, it's especially when talking about the massive transaction scale. Furthermore, customer is also launching some pro, uh, promotion programs like the Red Friday to promote the use of Yun San Fu app, app. And a transaction can surge up to 50% in a day. But business operation team found it hard to correlate the program and the business metrics, as well as the analyzing the user behaviors. Here's what we do. With holistic monitoring on the IT systems and unified access to business transaction, we sort out the logical relationship from the top to down and bridge the connection between the business operation and IT systems. Meanwhile, enhanced by AI technology, we provide operational analysis by scenarios so the customer can easily identify and locate the problems, get proactive alerts, detection, analysis, and automations. Business continuity and user experience has been greatly improved and get further assured. Let's go, let's go for a quick look at how does it looks like. Here's the financial control center. Sorry, it has to be in Chinese. Let me do a quick brief. In this page, customer has the whole picture of all business and financial related indices in a way that not only showing the metrics, but also demonstrating the co-relationship from back end to front end such as the system healthness, resources utilization, and business performance and risk. And we can look into the details of every aspect of index, like API performance, business view, 
IT healthness and performance view, which is showing the trend of orders and distributions as well as backend resources costs. So that's it for today's presentation. In a wrap up, Cloudwise is a leading AI ops provider and partners with Huawei to continually delivering business value in the journey of your digital transformation. Thank you. Thank you to our four presenters for taking time out to share with us. Our grand sponsor of this symposium, Huawei Cloud, is one of the key technology market players. They are an enabler of financial organizations to build digital platforms quickly and has artificial intelligence and big data capabilities to help financial institutions build their digital platforms. Once again, thank you Mr. Wu Shiwei, Mr. Matthew Chan, Mr. Edward He and Mr. Jay Lee for their insightful presentations. Ladies and gentlemen, don't leave just yet. Please stay tuned all the way to the end of this session as Huawei will be giving out a couple of attractive prizes. Stand a chance to be one of three lucky winners. All you have to do is complete the survey form that will appear right on the screen at the end of this session. Our next session coming up at 1 p.m. is titled Building a Bank Platform in 305 Days. We have an esteemed panel lined up that is going to share on the current exciting new opportunity where greenfield sites are challenging regulators to bring new, best-in-class technology to the country's neo-challenger scene. Do click on the next session button below to join us and I will see you there.